Welcome to our worship today. It is a real special day. We're calling this Sunday Co-Mission Sunday in that, that this is the co not just the Great Commission where Jesus says, as you go, make disciples of all nations, but he actually is part of that. He lets us be a part of that mission. And, and we, as a church, sent two different groups to the opposite directions. The youth to Savannah, Georgia on the Atlantic coast, uh, a group of adults in combination with St. John Lutheran Church going to Guatemala. And, and it, we're going to be seeing and hearing their reports of how they were on a co-mission with Christ to actually show his love in practical ways. And so that's what we got right here with this, this service. And I want to preface it. Um, well, first, let's just start. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all that. But I want to read this gospel lesson because this is commission and practice. It's Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21, the feeding of 5,000. Now when Jesus heard about the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds learned of this, they went there by foot from the surrounding towns, so that by the time he went ashore, a great crowd he saw, and he had compassion upon them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they don't have to go away. You give them something to eat. And they replied, well, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, well, bring them to me. He then ordered the crowds to sit down on the green grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. All ate and were satisfied. And when they gathered, they gathered what was left from the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. Now those who had ate were about 5,000 men, not including women and children. You see what happened there? God, Jesus could have just fed all those people. But he wanted human involvement. And so he says, what do you have to give? And it was meager, but with Christ's own power, it became more than plentiful. It became bountiful and, and abundant. And the disciples were even gathered to gather over leftovers. Now here's where I think this is good in the co-mission of today, is that we send people off. They went to far places. They didn't know anybody. They did wonderful work, and they came back with their baskets full but not leftovers, things to savor, their memories, their prayers answered, their, their understanding of relationships. All that is part that we, having sent them, are co-missionaries as well. We hope you're blessed by this, these presentations. And it also it kind of whets your appetite for the Holy Spirit to use you in the future to spread that gospel. And as you go, make disciples of all nations. Let's pray. Merciful Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity before us. Jesus said the fields are ripe for the harvest. Pray for harvesters to go out and reap that harvest. May we be a part of that. Thank you for those who, who took time and expense and energy and effort to go forward and do that sort of thing. Thank you for this congregation for supporting them and they're doing so with financial contributions, with prayers and support. And thank you, O oh Lord, for the opportunities that you present before us. May we, your faithful servants, get out in your harvest. In Jesus we pray. Amen. I hope you were blessed by all that because, man, the stories are, are, are captivating and, and I hope they actually, like I said at the start, whet your appetite to be a part of mission trips in the future. As far as what's going on, we are coming really close to a 30-mile mission. The, in the Narthex, in our church, there's all sorts of sign-up sheets of projects, plenty of opportunities to do so. That is the third weekend in August. It goes from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, including, people were asking, opportunities to work at Habitat for Humanity just in our own backyard. Um, we want to be, also remind you of the block party we have in conjunction with our neighborhood on the 19th of August. Um, put flyers are out, then a possibility that this could just blow everything away. Um, in the midst of everything else, <clears throat> for the next week or so, Patty and I will be gone. We're traveling to Michigan and taking our time, hopefully, to get back in time for all this. But in the midst, the office will still be open. People can help you out. But in the midst of everything else, give glory to God, and may he use you in very ways for his kingdom. God bless you.
A youth works trip is hard to describe to those who haven't been. There's a certain stress that's felt going into it, knowing you're about to lose most of the decision making over your life for a week. Then they're sleeping on the floor, surrounded by a dozen or more people, the uncertainty of where you'll be placed to serve for the week, and who you might serve with. No privacy, no alone time. You cook together as a team, clean together as a team, and it's not easy. But as the sun sets on your first day, something beautiful happens when you strip away most of the familiarity from your life. These trips focus on serving the communities we travel to, opening our eyes to the challenges of an unfamiliar place and also the people and organizations working to solve these challenges. But it goes much deeper. We learn how to live in community. We learn to listen a little closer, to serve one another. We worship together and laugh together. There's morning devotions and storytelling and a time to debrief each night. We watch for and share the ways God has been present in our day. And for a short period, you begin to forget about the regular mundane life back at home and embrace a new norm of daily service. Thursday night lands, you feel like you just arrived, but it also feels like you've always been here. And then we're reminded of Jesus' example of servanthood for us in the Gospels through foot washing. And so, leaders are privileged to wash the feet of these students. Leaders pray for them, speak truth over their lives, and bless them in anticipation of them returning home to the things God already has planned for their lives. The word that best describes our students at the end of the week is eager. Eager to find ways back home to serve their communities and keep the momentum going. You see, it goes without saying these trips are grounded in God's word and showing love to an unfamiliar community. But the unexpected is that God uses these trips in astonishing and unexpected ways to grow the hearts of all the students and adults in ways that pay dividends for years to come. Your youth who participated on this trip this year are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. They are here. We are here. You are here. So one word I have taken away from this trip uh, for me would be perseverance or to persevere. Um, at the beginning of this trip, it was interesting to start with. Uh, my family was coming with me. Um, my parents and my littler sister, as well as my older sister, as she was going to go on the trip with me also. Um, but my parents and my littler sister were just in it for the Disney portion. And then uh, while we were staying in a cockroach infested church, um, they got to stay at a Disney hotel. So I was a little bit salty of that at the beginning, but I kind of realized that everything came together like that for a reason. Um, but moving on, after we had all spent a long day at Disney going on rides, uh, waiting in lines, um, sweating, it, it was fun and it was a well-balanced day to say the least. But 8 o'clock rolls around and my mom gets a phone call. And she picks up the phone and after that phone call I had learned that my grandpa was no longer with us that day. And it was, it was difficult because... Before this trip, I had felt super prepared. This was my fourth mission trip. Uh, I was the oldest on the trip, and I thought I was going to be there to mentor everybody else. But at, after that phone call, it kind of felt like I needed a mentor. Um, so I was ready for this trip, but I wasn't ready for that. So I took away that you really can never prepare, no matter how hard you try, and no matter how prepared you felt. I was tired, yes, but I felt ready. I felt well-situated, I felt organized, and I was comfortable. But after that phone call had received and what I learned about my grandpa, I, I was no longer prepared. So after that, I had gone with my family back to their Disney hotel, and I decided that I should make a decision on whether or not I would be staying on this trip or whether or not I would be going home with my family. And that was where I felt really lost. And that's what I wasn't prepared to do, make a decision like that. I really thought this was going to be a pretty easygoing trip. And it turns out that you can't prepare for that. I, knowing that I had to make that decision, I decided I would go on a walk because that's just what I do. That's, what I, that's where I think best is when I'm just walking around. 
And I had thought, I'm going to call my grandma. I'm going to see what she would have, what she would want me to do. And so I called her and without any hesitation at all, she said, you should go on this trip. So, um, and she also mentioned about how happy my grandpa was that I was going to be doing this. And I was like, okay, I know immediately I was like, all right, I know what I have to do. And that's where my word persevere comes into play or to persevere. And that's exactly what I had to do. Um, and I, I knew why I had my why in that moment after I called my grandma and I also called other family members and it just, it gave me the motivation to kind of go and do this for him. Um, no matter how difficult it might have felt in that time. So that's where the perseverance kind of came from for me. And that's where I got my motivation. Um, so I went on this trip. I texted Tim and I told him that I would be going and to come pick me up from the hotel at probably 9 a.m. And I just rolled with it from there. So it was our first night at YouthWorks. We had just gotten in at 6 p.m. roughly on, um, on a Sunday after we had spent Saturday at Disney. And the YouthWorks staff do this thing where they share their stories. And one of the YouthWorks staff stepped up and he had talked about how his grandpa had passed away suddenly and how he also had to make a difficult decision on whether or not he would go on a mission trip of his own. Um, and he also had mentioned how he had to talk to his grandma about this and how his grandma had wanted him to go also. So that was kind of my confirmation from God that I had made the right decision. You are here to persevere. Uh, hello, my name is Dylan Brown, and I just went on my second mission trip. If I had to describe uh, this year's mission trip with one word, I would say humbling. And for that reason being, I thought that this year's mission trip would be a lot easier than my last one because I'd just been on one. Um, going into my service days, we were inside for both our days, starting out with a, a thrift store that we worked at and then at a food bank uh, washing dishes. Uh, going to my third day, we went outside and started pa painting a man's home, and I was not ready for that. Um, I thought I would be, because in Denver we also painted, but that's a different type of heat, it's a dry heat. But in Savannah, Georgia, it's a humid heat, and when it's 97 degrees out and 70% humidity, it's a lot hotter than you would think it would be. Um, we were outside the entire day working for about seven hours, and our first mistake was we took a break about not even halfway through and all of us took a break and it was a long break. And after this break, we were sluggish and tired and didn't really want to finish our work because the heat had really gotten to us and uh, the food was sitting on our stomachs. So coming back to, this, to our site, I talked to Sarah and her group because she had just worked there and she gave me a few pointers that would really help us on our next day. And she said that not to take a break that early and to take a very late lunch break, about 1.30. We would end our service there about 3, so it was quite late. And she also said not to stop for long periods of time, for about 5 minutes max, and only have one or two people stop, not the entire group. And as we did this, I saw that this helped in great magnitude. Uh, we got through it a lot faster. The lesson I really learned from this situation was community is key to getting things done. And that's not just with the service site, but also in your faith. If you go into it alone and thinking, being overly confident and thinking that, oh yeah, I might have been here before, I can do this, you'll, you'll get beaten down and get worn out a lot faster than if you're with the group and take advice from people that have already gone on that path. In a community, we have people to rely on but we have to be truly honest with ourselves that we need help. We have to come to them and ask for that help. You might not be painting a house, but you might be dealing with loss, switching jobs, or a number of other things. God gave us people to help us and to rely on in confusing or difficult situations. You are here to be in community. Hello, my name is June Burfinger, and this is my third mission trip with the youth. Um, I did not really feel called to go on this youth mission trip. I mean, I knew I was needed logistically, and Tim and Sarah needed me, so yeah, sure, I'll go along because that's just what I do. So, but before I went, I was questioning whether my 50-year-old old woman status, do I even connect with the youth? Am I really needed 
as, as a presence in the youth group. And so I was concerned whether I relate to them. I mean, would they rather have like 20 or 30 year old hipsters, you know? And so I was like, I just don't know. However, I soon realized that I needed to relearn an old thing that every Christian knows all the time. I mean, we're taught this, we sing about it in songs, and that is we are the body of Christ and that all parts are needed for a healthy body. However, I think an important aspect of that that we sometimes forget is that we need to engage those body parts to be a healthy body. Um, if we don't engage some of these parts, they just atrophy and don't really, I mean, we just become old and wither and die. We have to maintain a healthy thing. So I think it's so important to realize we are meant to share our struggles. We are not meant to hide our struggles. We are meant to be vulnerable with each other and not to hold it in within ourselves and bear it alone. We are meant to share our worst of times that we have because you come to realize other people also struggle. You are meant to share your struggles so you can lean on people. We are meant to reach out if we see someone struggling and not just say, oh, they're going to be okay, but to act, really ask them, are you okay? And to share in that struggle with them. It's risky, but oh, how God shows up when we do that as the body of Christ. He opened up doors for the youth that were vulnerable. He opened up sharing the struggles and weaknesses of these youth and and the leaders that they were afraid to bring forth before. And he just opened them up. God showed up. I honestly can say each and every time that we were at a low or asking for help, he showed up in big ways on this trip. So what did I do? I did engage. I engaged in teenage boy humor. <laughs> that was awkward sometimes. And I think sometimes they were almost a little impressed with some of my knowledge. <laughs> I, I was engaged by seeing someone struggling in the group and I went to them. And I am so very thankful that I did. I engaged by giving hugs when that's all I could do because words were not adequate. I engaged by giving support and words of encouragement in places where they really needed words of encouragement in. I engaged by sharing my struggles with the youth. They were not aware of some issues that I was dealing with. And by me engaging with me, showing my struggles, and by them sharing their struggles, my cup, seriously, was filled to overflowing. I mean, like bursting for God and Jesus. Some people that were painting on a house, for instance, might have heard me screaming, I love Jesus, I love Jesus. I know it sounds a little corny, but I really felt overflowing from that. Um, it's hard going on a mission trip and coming back to a normal environment. So many times this week, I wasn't with the youth. I wanted to call them up and I wanted to say, what's going on? How's everything going? Is everything going good? Because I feel like, bam, we came back to a world that was not in a protected, godly environment. And it's a, it's a real struggle. We always, um, I'm going to continue to strive and engage and not let the phones, your jobs, school, anything of this world, movies, Facebook, Instagram, all that to keep me from the healthy, engaged body of Christ. It is so important that we maintain that connection together because that's what makes us strong. And we, we feel like we get blessed by God's love. Um, I want to say what a complete blessing it was to be part of this trip. We always come back and say, oh, this trip is great, and we got along really great, and the kids did great, and oh, we're so proud of them, and we were touched by God. Yay. We always say that. I know we do. I just want to stress to everyone, um, I felt this group was spectacular. They are really special kids, and I really want to say God showed up big time.
and the presence of God was felt throughout this trip, and it truly was a special time. And this group of children are very special kids. Parents and congregation, I seriously want to thank you for your support through prayers and financially. You guys help create a time. You created a space for these kids to have so important conversations that were desperately needed. You gave a space for them to have guidance and a space for them to be open and vulnerable, which is so very difficult, and a space to listen and they were able to hear God's whispers and it's space to know and feel God's presence. So you are here to engage. I encourage you to do so. I will continue to strive to do that and blessings to you. Hi, I'm Rick. And I'm Cheryl and we're here to talk to you about our Guatemala mission trip uh, that we just came back from, uh, we were gone July 23rd through 30th. There were 10 of us that went total, four from this church and six from St. John in Salmon Creek. We had five women and five men, one married couple. Uh, the youngest man was 13 and the oldest person on our team was 78 years old. So we actually represented three different generations. Uh, this picture is actually in front of the Holgar, which we got to visit. Uh, the Holgar is the children's orphanage. Um, our team's task was really to love on the kids and to also be the very first team to start building the wall. And Rick will talk more about that in a little bit. We all had unique gifts and unique personalities. Uh, we actually have uh, the children's orphanage here. There's a picture of the front as well as a picture of the back. Uh, for those of you that went almost five years ago, it's the same orphanage. It's on the same location as it was before. There are currently about 19 children there. The home itself is licensed for 20. I must tell you all, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for all your prayers, for all your gifts. We were able to take five loaded suitcases, including a lot of musical instruments that Beacox donated to us. Also, medical supplies, school supplies, all kinds of clothing. Um, it was really overwhelming, all the things that we took to leave at the orphanage, and people were very impressed. And some of those suitcases were between 50 and 70 pounds. So they weighed a lot. It was a lot of stuff. Uh, there were children there. They're cared for by nannies. Um, most of the children right this time were between the ages of one and three. There was one baby who was five months old. There was about four children that were school age between the ages of four and six but the majority were the toddler age. We also got an opportunity to meet Jose, our, um, our child that we have now adopted, our new child, since the old one went away, so to speak, or he, he was housed, and so we have a new child now. But we just spent some time uh, that first day getting to know the children, which was a lot of fun. They do still require that we wear masks in the Holgar, and that's a very good thing, which you'll hear later on about. Uh, here is actually our adopted child with Liz and myself. Every child has a really unique story, and although we didn't get real personal with any of the children, amongst other things, there's a, definitely a language barrier, but we just spent a lot of time just loving on them and hugging them, as you'll see in some of these pictures. And they were a lot of fun. They just loved us. You know, just loved us. We played really hard, too, uh, really hard, which was also a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun with the balloons, a lot of fun just rolling around on the floor. For those of you that are part of the LWML, you may remember at the national level, last year there was a big donation made to uh, Child Beyond International for a medical bus. This bus, this is a picture of the actual bus. It's on the Holgar property. It has all been retrofitted, and so we got to take a tour of the inside of it and see how everything is being set up to do both medical and they hope to also provide dental care. At first, there was a thought they were going to decorate the outside of the bus and make it more pronounced that it is truly a medical bus, but then apparently there's been a decision made now not to do that for safety reasons. So the bus is just going to kind of keep looking like this on the outside, just a regular bus. 
This is lunchtime, and you may, it may be kind of difficult to see, but there's a whole row of, hair, of high chairs. There's a lot, of, a lot of children that are high chair size right now. So they're very organized at everything they do at the Hogar. They have, an, they have a, a, a schedule and a system for everything, and they keep up the schedule, and it's really, it amazed me how rigid the whole thing was. But I guess that's how they keep it all together, so to speak. We saw so from this church, I was able to take $750 uh, with us uh, to buy shoes because one of the things, if you'll recall the, on that list of needs, were shoes, and there were many shoes. And when we got down there, the director of the, of the Hogar decided she wanted to take each child individually to pay less shoes so that the shoes could be tried on individually per child. So this ended up being a half a day affair we, they have a, new, a newer van, so we took the driver slash interpreter, the director, whose name is Axel, the director of the Hogar, who is Paola, then we took a nanny, then all three of us, Liz and one of the ladies from the other church and myself, spent all day Wednesday at, at the Hogar, and we, take, we, we took children five at a time to pay less shoes. I think of interest is they had to really talk these children into go, getting in this van because apparently the only time they ever get in the van is when they're going to the doctor to get immunizations. So they were all crying and they did not want to go. They were think they were going to get shots and so they weren't going, they weren't having it. Uh, but it was fascinating when we actually got there and to see their faces. I'm sure these children have probably never been in a shoe store. Uh, the other thing that I think was really interesting is how much the shoes actually cost each pair of shoes were between 35 and 40 American dollars for one pair of shoes. Now we got a deal, we got a buy one, get one half price, just like we have sometimes here. But I was still really shocked by how much the shoes actually cost. And that was pay less too. Yeah, that was pay less, that was pay less. And they had a really fascinating way in the store of marking the children. They had a little sticker, they put on their, them, she, had, she had someone measure the shoe, or the foot, and then they wrote the, the shoe size actually on the sticker and put the sticker on the child. So that's how Paola knew what size to look for. And they got everything from Spider-Man shoes to Disney shoes, uh, Princess shoes. There was purple and pink, and a lot of the kids were, had ended up with flashing shoes, and they thought that was really cool. You know, the kind you step on that make lights. So they were just having fun. Here's some of the bags that the shoes ended up being in after they were purchased. They literally had fun playing with the bags. You know, it didn't, it was really, it was. And, and didn't the nannies actually have a little game that they played just to keep the kids busy so they wouldn't get bored waiting for the oh, transactions oh, to yeah, take place? Oh yeah, yeah, yes, it was quite a, it was quite a deal. Quite, but, it, but it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun. It really truly was fun. So thank you, thank you again. Here's another picture of some of the girls. These are actually school age girls, but I wanted to make sure that we got to showcase those pillowcases that some of you quilter type ladies made. Uh, very excited. They just wanted to wear those dresses right over their clothing. They were very excited about that too. Oh, the shoes as well. They wrote their names on the bottom of the soles of their shoes with a permanent marker. So they each have their own bin of clothing and they keep it separate. They, they don't mix clothing. So it was kind of interesting and they're not gonna mix those shoes either. So those are some of the princesses. And now I'm gonna let Rick talk about the project. Yeah, so um, the, Property, the site in which the new orphanage is being uh, constructed is in the little town of Santos Calderas. And uh, this is the entry sign to the, the uh, uh, community, the village there. And that's one of the first roads that we went down as we were getting ready to go into the property. Some of the roads were paved with paving stones. Uh, this one uh, that we entered in uh, obviously is well paved with dirt and gravel and holes and everything else that you could expect. So this slide that we're looking at right now is kind of a sketch of the overall 10 acre portion of the property itself on the right. On the left is a blow up of the work site itself represented by the line in the lower uh, quadrant, lower right quadrant, that red line there. And that's, the, that's where we started constructing a wall in about uh, a space of about uh, uh, 25 yards. That was the first project to start. Uh, here's another view of the property looking up to the north end of the property itself. And you can see even at the top portion of the, the property and above and beyond are orchards of uh, um, avocado, coffee, and corn. Corn was everywhere. 
corn is year long in the country of Guatemala, never stops growing. And how high were we? We were approximately 7,300 feet. Uh, we actually crawled up as high as 7,900 feet and then came down into the little town where the property is located. The house itself, the team house, is at the 5,100 foot level. And here's a representative of some of the blocks. We spent a lot of time moving cinder blocks that each weighed 25 pounds apiece from one spot to another because there's no mechanized way of being able to haul these things into where they need to be finally placed. And so we lined them up alongside of the trench that uh, several workers from a contractor had actually dug by hand and uh, made sure that they were easily more accessible there. On one end, we had, the, on, the, on the right side is where the blocks had been first deposited, and where I'm standing is where we had to carry them to. Uh, not a, not a easy effort for anybody. On the, this slide is kind of a representative of the, uh, the young and the old. That's my son, Ricky, uh, on the first uh, page holding the brick high, he's 13. And uh, next to him is Lionel, who's 78 years old. Again, to what Cheryl was saying about three uh, generations of people in between working on that. The photo of the right was our girl power. Uh, each one of them were uh, also strong contributors in hauling these bricks from one point to the, uh, the other. And uh, actually, some of them worked uh, every bit as hard, maybe harder than what I did. So was, they kept the competition going. Another view of the trench itself um, and more blocks and people kind of understanding what to do. There was a, every day was a new task that which we were assigned to do. We weren't quite sure what that task was going to be when we got to the property. It took us about an hour and a half to two hours from the team house to arrive at the property, depending on the traffic. Um, so uh, we were kind of setting out our plans every day as we went through things. We also spent a considerable amount of time tying rebar. And that's not an easy task in itself. We actually had to build the little angle irons that held the rebarb together, and then we would tie them and twist them together with a special technique to make sure that we got it right. And we spent a lot of time discussing what the right method and approach to tying rebarb was. And there was a little bit of discontinuity between the members of our team as we tried to get it right. And then our worker contractors would come up to us and they'd say, oh, that's excellent. Uh, after one of our colleagues would say, that's not right. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun uh, going through that process. Um, here's a, a, a shot of uh, the first pour of concrete that was being made. Um, the concrete itself was mixed about 100 uh, feet away from where it was being poured by these wheelbarrows. We had a little uh, racetrack that we were using. Uh, we had four wheelbarrows of concrete mud kind of going from the mixer to the uh, uh, pour itself. And that, this is kind of an example of that. Um, the weather turned nasty on us one day. Uh, and when I say nasty, I'm not talking about a Vancouver rainfall. I'm talking about elephant ears falling from the sky. It rained so hard. You know, we, we had to finally ditch into a covered area. Uh, and then before we started work the next day, they decided to move the rebarb tying area up into a barn in the northern part of the property. And that's where we finished the, our activities. The cornerstone. So as we finished our project up, we took one of the cinder blocks and we everybody on the team signed that cinder block. And that became the cornerstone of the property right on the corner um, you know, in the, in the uh, south south uh, east corner of that, that property of the wall. So that's the anchoring portion of that wall. We're all pretty proud of that. Uh, the trip that we took from, I told you it was about an hour, an hour and a half every, every morning, every evening, going back and forth. This is the team house, the outside of it. Pretty plain, nondescript, not marked. It's in a gated community, so it was relatively safe for us. But we also passed by several interesting things on the road. What we're seeing here on the right side is actually chrome bumper grills that were sported on many trucks and wagons and other kinds of things. We saw a lot of mufflers. These buses, we called them chicken buses. I don't know why they called them chicken buses. Maybe because they play chicken with the other cars on the road. 
Uh, you can see in the lower uh, left-hand corner, uh, it was pouring down rain, and that uh, bus was, he was probably, I was in the back seat taking that picture maybe 10 feet away from us. Um, and then very angrily, he went around us. Um, not that we were going that slow either, we weren't. Volcanoes in Guatemala, there are 64 different volcanoes. Some active, most of them are inactive. Some are very active, and here's an example on our trip where we had both active and inactive uh, sites. Uh, it was pretty interesting when we saw that. Um, the day that it was really raining, uh, coming back home was uh, pretty harrowing. There were several accidents that uh, were, uh, um, we came up upon. One was a big diesel truck, regular, you know, like a, you know, 18-wheeler that was actually almost going into the other side of a divided highway. Uh, and just kind of hanging on the guardrail as we went by, but you can see how the roads were flooding from the massive amounts of water coming down. Food was an important part. We were well fed, and I'm here to proudly show that. Uh, our cook, uh, Isa, she did just an outstanding job. One day we had barbecue grilled meat uh, steak out uh, and, uh, and plantains as well on the grill that were just very, very yummy. She kept us well fed. One morning for breakfast, we had omelets. That's the picture on the right. We did have time for some fun. One day, Saturday, uh, Friday, we actually took off. That was the day it wasn't raining, which was really good. Uh, and we went to the uh, town of Antigua, which is at the base of one of the uh, um, volcanoes that a long time ago had actually erupted an earthquake and almost destroyed the town. And so we visited some of the ruins that uh, were associated in that village still. Uh, very amazing, one, wonderful place to go to. We also went shopping, which is the picture on the right, which was just delightful. We had time to have a meal together in Antigua and see some other sites. Um, the, what, did, what was the name of the cross? It was on the just the church on the, the cross on the hill. Cross on the hill, which was just a very uh, beautiful shot of the city. Uh, and you know, the cross itself was pretty amazing. And here's where children just make a difference. Our mission was about the kids, and uh, it warmed our hearts, it warmed their hearts, and you know the love of God and His grace really kind of just made this such a worthwhile uh, adventure for all of us. And that is our presentation. They were actually playing instruments donated by Beacox, and I, I tell you, they're the little zoop, 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 and uh, harmonicas, and and shakers, and uh, it was, they made quite the noise, a joyful noise. Now, thank you so much for all your support, and thank you mostly for all your prayers, because they were definitely felt. Yes, we came back, oh, we didn't say this. <laughs> we came back <laughs> strong and healthy, except <laughs> after we got here, five of our members, including my son Ricky, got COVID. We got uh, the first notification about 10 hours after we got back, the first group text came through. Oh, by the way, oh, I have bad news. I have very bad news. Yet our Guatemalan, our Guatemalan, Guatemalan friends remain very, very healthy. So far, they're all healthy. Yes.